This might be one of the most interesting charts that I've seen around Bitcoin in a while. Glassnode, which is a data provider uh, for a lot of the on-chain data, uh, tweeted this out yesterday. And I spent a lot of time looking at it. And I spent a lot of time talking to people about it. And then I talked to Joe and John about it all morning. And I think it might be one of the most important charts in all of Bitcoin at the moment. And so what this chart shows is the proportions between long and short-term holder supply. So what it basically does, and look, you see all the squiggly lines everywhere. Like when you look at it, you're like, it must be important. It's got squiggly lines going all over the place. There's three lines. May not be able to tell it. There's only three lines. There's a blue line, a pink line, and a black line. Blue, pink, black. The blue line is the long-term holders. People have been holding Bitcoin for at least a year. The pink line is the short-term holders. It's supposed to say STH. It says LTH on pink. They made a mistake. No problem. STH is the pink. LTH is the blue. Long-term holders in blue, short-term holders in pink. The black line in the background, that is the price of Bitcoin from a logarithmic standpoint. And so when you lay these three lines on top of each other, what you can see is going all the way back to 2013. When Bitcoin hit a long-term holder supply of 63%, that led shortly thereafter to a bull market. You then can see that the supply of long-term holders dropped as the price went up. And then it kind of waffled back and forth. You see that word right there, Joe, waffled. And then all of a sudden we get to the end of 2016. And again, we get a long-term holder percentage of 71%. When we get to 71%, bam, price explodes upwards. And then as you see the price going up in 2017, what happens is the amount of long-term holders goes down because people are selling the Bitcoin into the market. They see price going up and at certain price points, people are willing to sell Bitcoin that previously weren't willing to sell. So long-term holders hit 71.5% beginning of 2017. Bam, all of a sudden price takes off. People start to sell their Bitcoin into the bull market. So we come back. We see again in April of 2019, same exact effect. There is a 67% long-term holder supply, and then we get a bull market. And then in October of 2020, long-term holders hit 68%, 68.2% BAM bull market. Now, it goes without saying that history is not a predictor of future performance. But the reason why this chart is so fascinating is because Glassnode was able to take a look at this and understand that whenever that long-term, oh, excuse me, that long-term holder supply is between 63.6% and 71.5%, often we get a bull market in the months after. Now, that does not mean it's guaranteed. That does not mean that it always happens. You can see in 2015 or so, we were there for a while at very high levels of long-term holders. And eventually we then got a bull market. So timing, hard to tell. The exact kind of sequence of events though, a uh, pretty good historical comparison. And so right now, where are we? If you look on the far right of this chart, we are at 66%. So between 63 and 71 and a half percent, that tends to lead to the bull markets or, or kind of large increases in price. We're at 66%. We just came back from that big dip and now we have entered basically the middle of that bracket. And so this is another data point that continues to show what we're watching is strong hands. People who hold for a long period of time, they're not trading, they're not selling Bitcoin. They continue to accumulate Bitcoin and they're holding it for that long period of time. When that happens, this is just a simple, another data point, another chart that contributes to the supply squeeze thesis. If history repeats itself, which there's no guarantee that it will, but if it does, we will point back and say, the long-term holder to short-term holder proportional supply was a no-brainer that indicated that price was going to go up. We'll see what happens. But Joe, John, as two Bitcoiners over there, people that are long Bitcoin, what's, what's the thoughts on the chart? I like the chart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of the chart. I happen to like the chart too. Do we think that, uh, like it is, uh, do we think that it's a reliable source uh, of data in terms of uh, indicating what it what is probabilistically likely to happen? Yeah, I think uh, what's the saying when like kind of in the disclosures where they're like, uh, you know, 
past performance is not indicative of future results. And that's true. Uh, so I think you obviously want to take all these things kind of with a grain of salt and, and judge for yourself. But anytime you can back test a set of data and look at it for future experiences and to kind of determine what the, uh, in the, especially in the case of supply and demand, right? An asset that derives a lot of its value from supply and demand. I think it's super uh, important and useful. So these charts, I think when you look at them in a combination of all the on-chain metrics, whether it's uh, the supply or the uh, kind of the the test away from, uh, you know, the last having and all that kind of stuff, whatever chart you're looking at, you look at them in unison and kind of all comprehensive. Uh, but I think they're helpful, yeah. John? Yeah, I'm a long-term thinker. So seeing, <laughs> seeing, seeing people hold it uh, for more than a year is definitely an indication of almost a slight conviction in the asset. Um, they think it's going to go up and they're not just day trading or anything like that. So I think it's very positive for Bitcoin and excited to see where it goes from here. I, it's a little hard to tell exactly. Can we pull up the chart one more time? Maybe I can see it on the other screen. But uh, if we look at it, what's fascinating to me on the far left side here, um, let's see if I can actually see what these numbers are. So on the far, uh, is it the left side or maybe it's the right side that we have to look? Um, the percentage never really seems to drop below a certain number, right? So the percentage of long-term holders actually has been uh, maybe like 50%. We've had long-term holders stay above 50%, which to me is really interesting because uh, when we have above 50% of all Bitcoin being held for what appears to be a decade or so, right? Really since like 2011, 2012, we've never dipped below that 50% or kind of bounced right off of 50% long-term holders. That explains why over long periods of time, the asset continues to do really well. It's because there's this base of, uh, of kind of Bitcoin believers that just are not providing any liquidity to the market, they're not going to sell that. So even though there's 18.8 million Bitcoin that are in circulation, they're not willing to put those Bitcoin into the market or they're lost, right? doesn't mean that necessarily investors are it could be lost as well. Uh, and then all of a sudden you say, hey, look, there's actually only 9 million or so Bitcoin that actually are even possible for uh, sale or, or for being turned over over almost a decade. And then when you start looking at 66% having traded hands in a year, you can see both kind of the shorter term and the longer term both end up being really attractive. So a lot of people, uh, you know, you can talk through the store of value and uh, kind of all the stuff related to currencies and transparency and every all the other kind of aspects that people talk about with Bitcoin and its value. But when it comes to supply and demand, is this just like the greatest uh, supply and demand trade that you've ever seen? I mean... <laughs> First, let's just look at like, is it the greatest trade period? Yeah. And over the last decade or so, Bitcoin has been the best investment that you could have made. Uh, so that's one piece of it. The second piece is supply demand structure in a market determines price, right? Yeah. As supplier demand moves, so does price. What is unique about Bitcoin and why Bitcoin likely is the simplest supply demand trade in history is that the supply is programmatic, right? Take gold as an example. We kind of sort of know how much gold exists. We kind of sort of know how much gold's coming out of the ground. We kind of sort of hope that we're not going to go mine asteroids of gold, et cetera. And we kind of sort of hope that no one finds a big deposit of gold. Yeah. But for the most part, we have a, a highly educated guess as to how much gold's in the world, how much gold's coming out of the ground on the annual basis. Bitcoin we know exactly. I can verify. I can tell you to the Bitcoin how much Bitcoin is in circulation. I can show you on a blockchain exactly 900 Bitcoin are coming into circulation every single day. And so when you can verify it and there's full transparency, what it does is it makes you much more accurate about predicting price movements in the future. And so with Bitcoin specifically, you not only get full transparency and uh, kind of verifiability, but you also then get pre-programmed changes to the supply. So that yep. Bitcoin having that happens every four years, you know there's going to be a supply shock every four years. Everyone in the market doesn't know that as well. And so what's occurred over the last decade is if you simply understood how Bitcoin was designed, you understood the structure, then you were able to capture the benefits of increasing demand for a disinflationary asset that had a fully constricted supply at 21 million and only 18 million or so are in circulation now, about 18.8 million. 
And on top of that, that disinflationary supply continues to drive down and create uh, more and more difficulty of acquiring Bitcoin, which leads to as long as demand continues to increase, Bitcoin's price has to appreciate to accommodate everyone. And that has been the trade for the last decade. If you did that, you did better than almost any other asset in the world, if not every other asset in the world. And I don't think that that's going to stop anytime soon. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching that clip of The Best Business Show. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications so you know when we go live every weekday, and then head to sofi.com slash pomp so that you can get an account and we can get after it.